Today we're going to do a close reading of a passage from chapter 3 of The Great Gatsby, which describes one of Gatsby's parties. Just as we do whenever we're deconstructing a passage, we're going to start by considering what is happening. Then we'll look at how the scene is being presented through literary devices and specific diction. And finally, we'll consider why Fitzgerald has chosen to present the setting of Gadsby's party in this way to convey some greater message about Gadsby's character. In our analytical reading today, we're going to practice the strategy of asking questions while we read. But before we begin, I'd like you to take a minute to go back into your book to page 40 and find the passage that's printed on your handout. In your book, go ahead and read around that passage for context to get your bearings. Flip to the pages before and after the passage and think about how these paragraphs fit in with the bigger picture of the novel. Go ahead and pause this video until you're ready to move on. Okay, so we're going to start by just rereading the passage on the handout. So go ahead and follow along with me while I read. At least once a fortnight, a corps of caterers came down with several hundred feet of canvas and enough colored lights to make a Christmas tree of Gadsby's enormous garden. On buffet tables garnished with glistening hors d'oeuvres, spiced baked hams crowded against salads of harlequin designs and pastry pigs and turkeys bewitched to a dark gold. In the main hall, a bar with a real brass rail was set up and stocked with gins and liquors and with cordials so long forgotten that most of his female guests were too young to know one from another. By seven o'clock, the orchestra has arrived, no thin five-piece affair, but a whole pit full of oboes and trombones and saxophones and violas and cornets and piccolos and low and high drums. The last swimmers have come in from the beach now and are dressing upstairs. The cars from New York are parked five deep in the drive, and already the halls and salons and verandas are gaudy with primary colors and hair shorn in strange new ways and shawls beyond the dreams of Castile. The bar is in full swing, and floating rounds of cocktails permeate the garden outside until the air is alive with chatter and laughter and casual innuendo and introductions forgotten on the spot and enthusiastic meetings between women who never knew each other's names. The lights grow brighter as the earth lurches away from the sun, and now the orchestra is playing yellow cocktail music, and the opera of voices pitches a key higher. Laughter is easier, minute by minute, spilled with prodigality, tipped out at a cheerful word. The groups change more swiftly, swell with new arrivals, dissolve and form in the same breath. Already there are wanderers, confident girls who weave here and there among the stouter and more stable, become for a sharp, joyous moment the center of a group, and then excited with triumph glide on through the sea change of faces and voices and color, under the constantly changing light. I love that passage. Okay, so now we're going to go back and read it again. And this time, I'm going to share some of my thinking with you, especially about the author's words, and mostly with the questions that I have when I'm reading. I'm going to show you how I use my questions about the setting of the novel to help me make meaning, pick up on patterns, focus my attention, and clarify confusion. So as we work through the passage, you should annotate your handout, marking the specific details in the text that illustrate the setting and that help you to make inferences about the character associated with this setting. Feel free to pause and rewind the video as you need it. So let's start at the very beginning. At least once a fortnight, a corps of caterers came down with several hundred feet of canvas and enough colored lights to make a Christmas tree of Gadsby's enormous garden. Okay, in this opening line, two things I'm thinking about. First, the once a fortnight. I remember when I was teaching Merchant of Venice um, that a fortnight referred to a period of two weeks. So it looks like at least once every two weeks or a couple times a month, Gatsby has these huge blowout parties. And also in that opening sentence, I'm wondering why Fitzgerald's choosing to use all these C words. Let's actually mark them. There's core, caterers, came, canvas, colored, and Christmas. I'm not quite sure why he's doing that yet, but it's definitely obvious, so I'm going to mark it and we'll keep reading. 
On buffet tables garnished with glistening hors d'oeuvres, spiced baked hams crowded against salads of harlequin designs and pastry pigs and turkeys bewitched to a dark gold. Well, here we go again, but this time it's G words. Gadsby's garden, garnished, glistening. I'm seeing this pattern emerge with the alliteration, but I'm not totally sure why. And then it happens again in that next line with the pastry pigs. So there's hors d'oeuvres, hams, and harlequin designs. Those H words and then pastry pigs, the P words. So this whole paragraph really is loaded with alliteration. And it's all like around these crazy foods and these over-the-top decorations. So I know from studying poetry that alliteration is often the writer's way of drawing the reader's attention to something important, like author highlighter. But why does Fitzgerald want me so focused on all the people who decorated with canvas and twinkly lights, or on all the crazy foods that are sitting out on the buffet table at Gadsby's parties? Okay, so time out for a second. Let's put this in your own words. Why do you think Fitzgerald is drawing our attention to all these details at the party, from the decorations and the decorators to the appetizers? Pause the video while you think and make a quick note to yourself, and then restart when you're ready to go. Okay, in the main hall, a bar with a real brass rail was set up and stocked with gins and liquors and with cordials so long forgotten that most of his female guests were too young to know one from another. Okay, so let's look at the next uh, sentence down. By seven o'clock, the orchestra has arrived. No thin five-piece affair, like it's not just a five-piece orchestra, but it's a whole pit full of oboes and trombones and saxophones and viols and cornets and piccolos and low and high drums. Kind of curious why Fitzgerald is choosing to use and in between every instrument instead of just a comma. I mean, it's a list. He could just have oboes, comma, trombones, comma, saxophones, comma, viols, comma, cornets, comma, piccolos, comma, and drums. So why all the ands? Well, either way, I'm noticing that Gadsby's entertainment for the evening is pretty darn impressive. There's a lot going on here, and there's a lot of ands, so I'm just going to keep that in the back of my mind, too. Okay, so Hopefully you've marked all of the ands in that sentence. Let's go ahead and take a look at the next line down, the last swimmers. The last swimmers have come down from the beach now and are dressing upstairs. The cars from New York are parked five deep in the drive. Man, how big is Gatsby's house if he has room for everyone to be dressing and getting ready upstairs after going swimming in the bay? Okay, so he's got all these people here. Um, and already the halls and salons and verandas are gaudy with primary colors and hair shorn in strange new ways and shawls beyond the dreams of Castile. How come Nick doesn't just say that the halls and rooms and patios in the house are full of people, that they're crowded? Or even full of people wearing primary colors and cutting-edge hairdos and fancy clothes? I mean, I get that these things are being used to represent the mucky mucks of New York who've come to this party, the trendsetters and uber elite who are populating his halls, but why has Nick removed the people from the scene? I'm picturing primary colors and short hairdos and gorgeous royal worthy shawls like floating around Gadsby's house, but like disembodied from the people that would be wearing them. And that's that's an interesting play here with his language, and I'm curious what Fitzgerald's trying to do. So I'm just going to note that, that like the people are sort of being removed from the scene. They're just described by their, their belongings and their trends. Okay. The bar is in full swing, and floating rounds of cocktails permeate the garden outside until the air is alive with chatter and laughter and casual innuendo and introductions forgotten on the spot and enthusiastic meetings between women who never knew each other's names. Okay, so here we have it again with the floating rounds of cocktails, that whole personless party thing where the cocktails are kind of like making their way through the gardens on their own. Um, but I'm just, I don't know, I'm wondering why Fitzgerald chooses to let the cocktails loose on their own, but to get rid of the waiters. Why not have the waiters passing the cocktails? Why do they take on a life of their own? And then, speaking of things that take on a life of their own, the air is alive. So not only are the cocktails floating around on their own, but also the air is alive and buzzing with people talking. 
And if I'm reading down a little bit, I remember seeing that the next line is about the earth lurching away from the sun. So I'm kind of wondering what's the reason behind Fitzgerald's use of personification in these two sentences. It seems almost like the party is coming to life as it gets darker outside. I don't know, maybe I'm supposed to infer that these parties like actually take on a life of their own or that the people who attend them don't really even matter. I don't know. It just, it seems like it's not actually about the guests. It's about all the stuff. Okay, so let's time out for a second. I want you to think strategically about asking questions during analytical reading. Often we think of the asking question strategy as something that readers do only when they're confused or need clarification on something. So I want you to think about this. What other types of questions have you noticed me asking so far, other than the I'm confused questions? I want you to pause the video while you make a quick note to yourself about types of questions, and then restart when you're ready. Okay, so that next line down, the lights grow brighter as the earth lurches away from the sun, and now the orchestra is playing yellow cocktail music, and the opera of voices pitches a key higher. I love this line. It's so beautiful. I'm picturing this total contrast of the setting of the sun and the brightening of the lights of the party. As one thing ends, another thing's just getting started. But the earth here, it's lurching. It's not slipping away from the sun or sliding or tilting away, but it's this really abrupt, sudden, uncontrolled jump or jolt away. So why is it lurching? It's like the earth is in some hurry to make it nighttime so that the party can begin. I'm not really sure why, but it's an interesting choice of words nonetheless. And then I'm also looking at um, yellow cocktail music, right? I don't think I've ever heard of sound described with color before. It's like those people who can um, see sounds and hear taste. I think it's called synesthesia, right? When they, when they they're like these, their senses cross, <laughs> I don't even know what it means, yellow cocktail music. I wonder why Fitzgerald is actually intentionally blurring the lines between the senses, between hearing and seeing. The line has sort of like a dizzying or fuzzy effect, which actually might be what it's like to be at one of Gadsby's ragers. You know, I'm picking up on one other thing. Remembering in the paragraph before with the oboes and trombones and saxophones with all those ands, If you look at the sentence before this one, the bar is in full swing and floating rounds of cocktails permeate the garden outside until the air is alive with chatter and laughter and casual innuendo and introductions forgotten on the spot and enthusiastic meetings between women who never knew each other's names. So I think I'm seeing this pattern now. He did the same trick just a few lines prior. So I'm wondering why use all these ands when a comma would do the trick? What's he trying to do here? I'm I'm starting actually to feel kind of overwhelmed by all the things he's listing off. I'm guessing there's a good reason for it, Um, but let's keep reading to see if we can piece it all together. Okay, so we've got all this and stuff, and then we have the yellow cocktail music, and now we have laughter. Laughter is easier minute by minute, spilled with prodigality, tipped out at a cheerful word. I actually had to look up this one, prodigality, It means excessive or extravagant waste. So now I'm wondering why Fitzgerald describes the ease of the laughter through the metaphor of a liquid substance being tipped and spilled. Maybe he's trying to get me to think about how, as the party goers are drinking more and more, they are laughing and becoming more relaxed. Or maybe I should take it a step further and consider that Gadsby is almost certainly serving alcohol, even though this takes place during the time of prohibition which might suggest something about Gadsby's character. Okay, so let's keep going. The groups change more swiftly, swell with new arrivals, dissolve and form in the same breath. This whole swell and dissolve makes me think of an ocean. Like the groups come in and go out like waves. They form and they reform fluidly and naturally. So this party is like, you know, everything's just comfortable and fluid and natural and things sort of move on their own, like waves coming in and out like the ocean. Already there are wanderers, confident girls who weave here and there among the stouter and more stable, become for a sharp, joyous moment the center of a group, and then excited with triumph, glide on through the sea change of faces and voices and color under the constantly changing light. 
Okay, so the sea change of faces things also makes me think of the ocean. And I think I'm actually starting to tie some of the patterns together that I've been wondering about. So we have the sea change of faces and voices and colors instead of just describing specific details about the people at the party. It's just the sea of faces. So I'm, I'm still wondering if the people, like I sort of mentioned before, don't really even matter at all. They're almost like a prop or part of the scenery. Then there's this use of and over and over again instead of commas, which is reinforcing the sense of like being overwhelmed by the party, that it's like it's over the top. And I'm getting this sense that the party, although it's totally packed with people, is also kind of hollow because the opening description is almost like a carnival with the lights and colors and food and music. And then the people littering the halls of the house makes it makes the house seem gaudy. And then the air comes to life with conversations that nobody remembers or really cares about. And then finally, the laughter that flows throughout the party is empty and overdone. It's over the top, the whole party. So even though it seems like an amazing party, I kind of get the sense that it's not all that it's cracked up to be. Okay, time out. Let's think for a moment about the structure of my analytical reading process. How did I use questions to move me from what to how to why in these paragraphs. I want you to think about one example from the video where I use the strategy of asking questions to help me move from what's happening in the scene to how the scene is being presented through literary devices and specific diction to why Fitzgerald presented the setting of Gatsby's party in this way. Let's go ahead and pause the video and think about it, make a quick note to yourself and then restart when you're ready. Okay, now it's your turn. Now that you've reread this passage with me and we've considered what's happening in the scene and how the scene's been constructed through literary devices, it's time to think about why. What's the so what of these paragraphs in chapter three? Is it just a party? Or more likely, does it help us to understand something bigger about Gatsby's character?